I am uh, Nick Gillespie with Reason. This is the Reason live stream. I'm joined by my colleague, Zach Weismuller. Hello. Say hello, Zach. Hi. And we are joined today by renegade SEC Commissioner Hester Peirce, uh, late of the Mercatus Center. She has written a very interesting, dare I say, blistering critique of a recent decision by the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, a regulatory outfit that was once headed up by Joseph Kennedy Sr. Uh, way back in the day at its origins. Uh, Hester Peirce, Commissioner Peirce, thanks for joining us. Nick, Zach, it's great to be with you. And you, I have to- You have a disclaimer. Please. I, I gotta start yeah. with my disclaimer, which is that okay. my views are my own views, not necessarily those of the SEC or my fellow commissioners. Okay, and you are coked to the gills right now, right? You are flying <laughs> on a mix of all sorts of illicit drugs. Uh, no coffee, but, but okay. that's about it. Yeah. yeah, and coffee is fully legal, at least for the time being. Um, we are going to run a clip uh, until what it uh, coffee, I'll say, is is legal, despite the fact that the SEC might start to regulate that after it gets through the crypto uh, space. Maybe a security. Yeah. You know, it, it certainly is acting like one. Um, we are going to run a short clip by uh, the chairman of the SEC, uh, Gary Gensler, um, talking about the Kraken decision. And then I want to come back to you and ask you about your dissent. Uh, Zach, can we roll should that? Put everyone on notice in this marketplace. This really should put everyone on notice in this marketplace, whether you call it lend, whether you call it earn, whether you call it yield. So those other platforms should right. take note of this and seek to come into compliance, do the proper disclosures and registration and the like. So what uh, Chairman Gensler there is talking about is a recent $30 million fine that was levied against the cryptocurrency uh, platform Kraken for um, issuing unregistered or unlicensed securities because they were allowing people to make money by parking their cryptocurrencies at, at the Kraken platform. You dissented from that fine. Can you explain what was wrong with it and why uh, you think it should not have happened? It's just the latest in a series of enforcement actions where we're seemingly uh, regulating the crypto industry through enforcement rather than doing the work of trying to sit down and figure out where are the connections with our securities regulatory regime and how is it possible for people to engage in the activities they want to engage in in a way that's compliant. Uh, and, and instead, what we tend to do in these circumstances is just shut it down. And that doesn't seem like, I mean, that is that is one way of protecting investors from participating in something, but it's not a way of protecting investors' ability to make decisions about what they want to participate in. Yeah, you called it lazy uh, in your, uh, in, in your uh, critique of it. Um, Zach, can you, uh, should we put up the uh, quotes for, or the, the tweets from, um, I was going to say the, the tweets from Jesse Powell, the head yep. of Kraken, who um, was saying like, oh, if all I had to do was fill out a couple of forms, as Chairman Getzler seems to suggest in his comments, um, I would have done that. Um, it, uh, C uh, Commissioner Purse, is there, I mean, is there a way right now for uh, crypto platforms to register with the SEC? Well, so there, there are a couple different um, things there. So this particular enforcement action was around Kraken's crypto staking program. And to the extent that staking as a service needs to be registered, and that has to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis, um, they could theoretically come in and register with us. But I think that's where the lazy... I was talking about the institution being lazy. We've got lots of very hardworking people here. It's not the employees, it's yeah. the institutions taking the lazy approach because it actually would require us to do some work to figure out what a regist what registering a crypto staking program would look like. And so it's not as easy as just downloading a form from the from the SEC's website, filling it out and you're ready to go. It would be a lot more complicated than that. Zach? There, there, so uh, we're going to be, uh, after uh, Hester Purse uh, leaves us today, 
we're going to be chatting a little bit with the author of this piece, Nick Carter, who has claimed that uh, there's something that he's cl he's calling Operation Choke Point 2.0. Uh, that's a reference to uh, an Obama administration era program uh, that was using the banking system to crack down on certain industries like payday lenders, um, sex workers, things like this. And uh, he he's characterized uh, what has been happening in recent months, a lot of this coming from the banking regulation side of things uh, as kind of a concerted effort across various government agencies, the FDIC and uh, the Fed to basically deny um, banking charters or financial services to crypto providers. Uh, there was a recent, uh, just yesterday, the SEC proposed uh, that they want to bar investment advisors from keeping assets at crypto firms. Uh, do you agree that there's this kind of, uh, I don't know, this concerted effort across various government agencies at this point to take a, a much closer look at crypto? And if that's true, is that warranted or are there some dangers um, in that kind of approach to things? Well, just as an initial matter, I think that description of what happened yesterday at the SEC is a little bit simplified. It was a broader rule around custody of investment advisors. It does affect crypto custody, and it's an area I hope we'll get some comment on. Um, I do have concerns about attempts to try to um, wall off crypto from the traditional financial system. A lot of people in crypto probably uh, find that somewhat attractive, but I think that there are going to be touch points between crypto and the traditional financial system, whether that's banks, investment advisors, um, broker dealers, and so forth. And I think what we need to try to do is figure out how, how traditional players are able to engage with crypto. Instead, it does seem that the government is take one by one saying, no, we don't want banks to do this. We don't want banks to, to, to custody. We don't want investment advisors um, to do this. We don't want there to be an exchange traded product built on Bitcoin. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And I think we have to be very careful. Uh, this is the whole reason that a lot of people are passionate about crypto, because too often the financial system has been used uh, as a way to exclude certain people and let other people in. And so I, I, I really get concerned when regulators show up and they're favoring particular uses or disfavoring particular uses of the financial system. I think we have to be very careful about that. Let's, um, uh, I, wa I wanna ask you, uh, I, I guess two questions, but first, um, and, and one is kind of historical. When you talk about the institution of the SEC being kind of lazy, you know, and, and it's very clear, you're not talking about the people who actually, you know, work there. Where does that, where does that come from? Um, where does that laziness or that kind of predisposition against innovation and change come from? And can it be fixed? I'm thinking, uh, you know, a few years ago, I read a biography of Joseph Kennedy Sr., the father of, uh, you know, John F. Kennedy, Ted Kennedy, uh, Robert F. Kennedy. Um, and he, one of the reasons he was so instrumental in the founding of the SEC is he, he you know, he said plausibly, uh, you know, at a point when the stock market was going to be regulated, I know every grift there is because I pulled it and I'm going to help you write and create a system where it won't be gained. I mean, is, is it possible for the SEC to not be kind of reactionary when faced with new, uh, you know, new kind of uh, financial instruments or opportunities that are presented, you know, most starkly in something like crypto, particularly Bitcoin? It's difficult for government agencies like ours to handle innovation well. And I knew coming into this job that that was an area I wanted I wanted us to think about and kind of examine ourselves to see if we were doing a good job with that. Crypto does, as you suggested, present the question very starkly. So what happens in an agency like ours is you get used to dealing with the same institutions time after time, they tend to be large institutions that can afford to wait while you think about their pro new products and services. And you're not used to 
uh, people coming in and challenging the incumbents, it's very hard to figure out how to how to interact with them. And so we're seeing that with crypto, especially because you're seeing people who are not they're coming from total totally from outside of the the, the financial system. They're trying something new. And it is difficult. But I do think that we could, if we made a choice to try to engage with whether it's it's crypto product entrepreneurs or 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 other product entre entrepreneurs, we could make a choice to do it better. It would certainly require a lot of work. And, you know, yes, I have all the the concerns um, about governments trying to manage innovation that that you all probably have as well. Um, and, and that's not the role I want us to be in, but I, I do think that we could try try for a fresh start. And how then you, more so, oh, go ahead, Zach. Well, I was just gonna ask, how do you think about what the SEC's role is dealing with a new asset class like crypto? Because it's, you know, you're the Securities and Exchange Commission and you, you know, traditionally, uh, regulate securities or people, you know, holding stock in a company uh, and cryptocurrency is a little bit different. And, and there's been a little bit of controversy about, you know, what even is a cryptocurrency? There's this ongoing discussion of, you know, whether the SEC or the CFTC, which regulates uh, commodities would be more appropriate. And then, of course, there's people people within the crypto world who don't want any regulation whatsoever. Um, and then this issue with Kraken has to do with not cryptocurrency per se, but uh, staking cryptocurrency. So you're using these coins to these tokens to kind of fuel the mining process. And maybe that's a little bit different than just holding, uh, you know, Bitcoin on a, on a custodial wallet. How do you think broadly about those questions and like what is cryptocurrency and what is the SEC's role in managing it? I'm going to give you the, the facts and circumstances line that lawyers mm -hmm. like to use. The, the thing about the definition security is a very broad, it's a broad concept. And so we can touch lots of different things that you might not at first blush think involves a security. Um, so I think we just have to look at everything on facts and circumstances. There is a question about whether, and I, I've disputed with some of my colleagues about what the definition of a, a, a whether crypto assets themselves fit within the definition of security. And it's probably not worth going into that discussion right now. I think the question is, are there some gaps in federal regulation where there isn't actually a federal regulator? Um, and I think that's probably true with respect to crypto assets and with respect to crypto trading platforms. Then you get to the question of, well, do we think we need a federal framework for that? I might feel one way about that. I think in light of some of the events of 2022, a lot of people think, yes, we want to have a federal framework. Then you have to think about, is the SEC the right regulator? I think if you're going to set up a federal framework, the SEC could be the right regulator for a lot of this. Um, but again, that's really not our our call to make that's congress's decision yeah can i follow up on that do you uh is there a sense that congress is moving to resolve that question i mean you know in a broad scope and i know i think everyone on this call has you know ties to you know one way or another george mason university and a, and a critique that emanates from that an economic and legal uh critique of the administrative state but is is congress working to do that or is this going to be something that either the CFTC or the SEC or somebody in, in the White House, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat, uh, comes up with? There certainly have been efforts to uh, draft bills, and, and we've seen some of those, and I expect we'll see many of them being reintroduced in this Congress. Mm -hmm. The question of whether you can get that across the across the finish line, you know, it's difficult. Um because a lot of the issues really are quite difficult to to draft, but but I certainly think it's it's on the radar of of people in Congress. And so, are actually, you comfortable though that I mean these are the same p cast of characters with you know some minor additions? Uh, you know they've gotten rid of some old characters and brought in some adorable new moppets like a long running sitcom. But by and large, these are people 
who, you know, whenever somebody from a tech industry shows up, they hold up whatever, you know, their Game Boy or their flip phone or whatever and say, can you help me fix this? I mean, are you, you know, I talked to Cynthia Lummis, the senator from Wyoming, who's very bullish on crypto. Um, she said that, you know, the level of uh, even under, uh, knowledge of like, you know, that it exists, much less expertise in crypto is stunningly small among her elected uh, colleagues. Well, as a regulator, I think it's really important that we take our guidance from Congress because they mm -hmm. are the ones who are politically accountable. And so, you know, it's important for people who are interested in this area or any other area to be in touch with their with their members of Congress. Um, but we really have to take guidance from them. Yeah. And I wouldn't assume that, um, you know, one of the one of the the theories behind agencies is that they're expert regulators. And we do have a lot of people here at the SEC with tremendous expertise in securities law, obviously, but also who know a lot about this technology. Hmm. But still, I you know, we can't design this without yeah. the input of politically accountable actors. Is that, um, is that point of view that you have, is that widely shared by your fellow commissioners? Well, I think so. I mean, I think we all recognize who the boss is and it's, oh. it's, it's not us, but, but I, I think one of the things that you're seeing happen in this area that's really causing me a lot of concern is that you're having regulation, uh, jurisdiction grabbing through enforcement. Right. If you plant your flag with enough enforcement cases, people start thinking, oh, well, I guess the SEC is the regulator or the CFTC is the regulator. Mm. And that's why I really would like for Congress to come in and say, no, this is who we want to be the regulator. This is how we want it to work. I'd like to bring up this comment because I think it represents the kind of, uh, you know, crypto enthusiast point of view on regulation. I just like to get your reaction to it. Denny Hicks says, I don't think the SEC should be involved in it at all. Uh, this was founded on that main idea to move away from any entity controlling the monetary investments and transactions. The group started Bitcoin because they were wanting to have full control over their finances without the federal level getting involved and in taking their cut or making any rules and regulations uh, for it. Violation of freedom. And, you know, th there's that that's true. Th that is why crypt that's why Bitcoin was started. That It's in the Satoshi white paper. And there's kind of the inevitability that regulators are going to try to regulate. You mentioned some of the issues that arise there with uh, kind of they get comfortable with incumbent firms and then makes it harder for new entrants. So this was all meant to disrupt that whole system. Is there a case for just saying, OK, if the SEC wants to put out some sort of registration form and make it optional and let people uh, who want to opt in to only the SEC approved versions, that's fine, but just let crypto be crypto and people can kind of enter at their own risk. Yeah, and I certainly understand that point of view, but I think we have the we have rules on the books and to the extent that whether it's crypto or something else, those implicate the existing rules, then we have to enforce those rules. Now, if you're talking about, do we want to develop a new regulatory framework where there really are gaps and where things really aren't covered? That's a conversation that we should be having. And I think one of the things I always say is don't jump to the conclusion that regulation is going to be the answer to solve your mm. problems. Mm. I mean, a lot of the problems we saw with centralized entities in the crypto world during the last uh, year are problems that are very similar to problems we see with, we've seen with traditional financial intermediaries. Um, but there also are things that people can do on their own to hold those intermediaries accountable. And as and as people working at intermediaries, they can do things to show people that they're that that they're doing what they're saying they're doing. So people in crypto shouldn't be jumping to the conclusion that regulation is is always the first and best answer. We have to have this conversation as a community. You know, I'm maybe on on one side of the spectrum and and, and saying, look, let's let's figure out whether there's a better way to do this but there are other people who are very much committed to having a regulatory solution and that's just something in this in this society we got to work out um, and figure out where most people are how much of the sense of urgency that seems to be kind of coursing through the sec and the cftc and and the federal government in general is being driven by the meltdown of ftx um 
and um, you know the uh, the apparent you know hypocrisy and kind of mendacity of of uh, Sam Bankman Freed. Um, and can you? Uh, I mean, is that um, particularly the stories that point to a very kind of cozy relationship between SEC Chairman Gary Gensler and SPF? Um, is that are are we in a mode now where something's got to happen, and weirdly, it's going to be you know, uh, the, the, the pretext for that is going to be dealing with somebody who is atypical of, um, of the way crypto platforms actually operate. And before you answer, I just want to give the full context of, of this story here, because, you know, we're not pointing the finger and accusing Gensler of anything necessarily. This story is just an example of the kind of, you know, political pressure that we speculate, you know, might, might be on him. This, this meeting that happened, um, the reporting was that, you know, Gensler was lukewarm to Friedman's pitch um, and wanted, uh, this is from Fox Business, um, any new SEC announced crypto exchange to mere standards of public exchanges like NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange. So, you know, it's not necessarily that anything wrong happened there that, that we know of, but I guess the, the question, and correct me if I'm wrong, Nick, is like, is that political pressure or, you know, what happened yeah. with FTX meltdown driving decision making at all within the SEC from your and opinion. and just to, you know, let put another layer of frosting on that um, SBF, we talked with Jesse uh, Powell of Kraken a few months ago. And one of the things he pointed out is that most of the major crypto platforms, which have been around for a decade uh, at this point or, or close to that, have come together on a kind of basic code of conduct, best practices. FTX was not interested in doing any of that. They were, and they were not registered in the U.S. except to the bare minimum that they needed to be. I mean, they were headquartered offshore, and they kept going to the SEC and other agencies to say, "Hey, let's do a, a special deal that that pulls us in." So that's what I'm saying. Where somebody like SBF is a typical of kind of the bigger and more established exchanges. So. You know, are we are we going to end up making regulations about crypto based on somebody who was a bad actor as opposed to the, you know, the kind of uh, more um, responsible people at the at really at the center of the industry? Well, I can't speak to FTX specifically. We do have an enforcement uh, case, but I, I'll say generally that the events of 2022 confirmed the preconceptions of many people uh, in the Washington world, which is that crypto is doesn't have any use and is is not decentralized and is all about uh, defrauding people. That's what some people in Washington think. So I'm not saying everyone does, but I think right. some people do. And that's why it's really important for people who are in crypto to think about, you know, applying the lessons from traditional finance, right? And thinking about that, thinking about you know, if you're really trying to build something decentralized, what does that actually look like? And then sort of thinking about whether it makes sense to say, let's try to carve out the decentralized world and figure out whether and really make the pitch that regulation is not do, wouldn't play the same role there because the decentralization, the on chain aspects, the fact that everyone can participate on the same terms that actually takes the place of regulation. It's harder to make that case when you're talking about large centralized intermediaries that are holding people's assets, right? So I think we can try to make some distinctions, but it's really important. I mean, and, and to the comment that you read earlier, Zach, yeah. you know, it is important to think about where are the spaces where people just want to be able to say, yes, I'm opting in to a less regulated space. I'm certainly open to something like that. I don't know whether, you know, others in Washington are, but I but I think, you know, everyone goes in eyes wide open. You've made a choice to operate in a space that has less regulation than other spaces. I mean, could you t talk just a little bit about the structure of the SEC for people who don't understand it? You know, this commissioner system. I've read your work on this. I know you were actually an advocate of that system. And now as someone who's, you know, inside of it, what is that like being, you know, on a, a board of commissioners who you know, disagree on topics and, and how does that form or how does that affect the, the ultimate decision making process? Yeah, I mean, there are five of us and the chairman sets the agenda and manages the staff. But 
and and so we have less input on 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 sort of the rules that we're going to be doing and, and so forth but we all have a voice and the idea is that you want to have people from different perspectives because you want to have some policy consistency over time we we all vote on every enforcement action and on every rulemaking um i you know people sometimes say to me well Hester, you do nothing except for talk about things so why don't you just resign and i think the point is and other people say to me well someone who is as skeptical of regulation as you are shouldn't even be at a regulator and my response is i think it's really important to have people with different voices saying we need to look at these things from a different perspective and um, you know, sometimes it takes a long time to shift the thinking, but I think it's it's worth having um, people sort of debating these things rather than just coming out with one view. I mean, the world is very complicated and there's there's more than one way to look at things. Uh, we've got two questions for you and we're going to let you go at 1.30. Um, first, can you, building on that, what is your general theory of good regulation in the financial sector? Um, you know, as when you were working at the Mercatus Center at George Mason, uh, you wrote a you you were a fierce critic of Sarbanes Oxley and Dodd Frank, uh, the last two mega kind of uh, you know pieces of legislation on the financial sector. What does good regulation look like? Um, you know, if you know if yeah. if you were able to write that. Well, I think. The first, my first principle is that if two people voluntarily agree that they want to do something, there needs to be a very good reason for the government to step in into that transaction and say, no, you can't do that or you have to do it differently. There are times when the two people's agreement to do something can have consequences for other people outside of that transaction. We have to be thinking about that. Um, so my my gen that's my general philosophy. I, I think we need to make sure that people's incentives um, are match up with consequences, right? So if you if you if you take a step that's a stupid step and you lose a lot of money, the government shouldn't be coming in to prevent you from losing it. Um, and unfortunately, that has happened a lot in our financial system, and it's sort of changed the way everything works, and it's led government to, to come in and say, well, since we're bearing the consequences when people make stupid decisions. We're going to try to make decisions for them. But because government doesn't have the right incentives, it's very difficult for government to make decisions effectively. Markets are much more effective at conveying information than a regulatory system is. And so we need to capitalize on that. We need to take advantage of the fact that markets transmit information really well. So that my, my theory is always, yeah, there's a place for regulation, but it shouldn't be the first place we look. It should be the last place. We what look. What does a good regulation or what what's an example, do you think, of a good regulation look, that I actually mean, reduces transaction costs without distorting you know, behaviors? I, or I think we can play a role in helping people get disclosure to make their own decisions about things. Mm -hmm. um, so. And, and certainly, you know, there are rules around mutual funds that I think have been effective rules. Um, there, there are a lot of things the SEC does that I think do help reduce transaction costs. But I think too often we try to just jump in and make a merit-based decision based on our understanding of someone else's circumstances. And I find that really offensive. Um, this question we have on our uh, YouTube live stream, people can pay uh, money to get make sure their question gets asked. So we always try to uh, uh, honor that. Uh, Dash, Guinness Stash, excuse me, uh, writes, I was reading about how the Web3 Foundation worked with the SEC on morphing Polkadot from a registered security to no longer a security. It became software. Can all crypto companies come in and do that too? Could you? Well, I'm not familiar with the circumstances of that particular uh, that particular question. Yes, people can come in and work with the SEC, but I think one of the problems that we've seen in the crypto space is that people are not coming out when they come in. They're not coming out with a workable solution to move forward, and that's what's so frustrating to me is you can't just be all about enforcement. You have to say you have to show people proactively that no, you can actually come in. We'll work with you to meet our regulatory objectives, which Congress gave us, but also to allow you to operate as a business, not to have you sitting in line or in the waiting room for three years as your funding dries up 
only to find out that you can't move forward. And that's what we really need to work on at the SEC. That's what I hope we can do. I still am optimistic that we can change our approach. Commissioner Hester Peirce of the SEC, uh, thank you so much for talking to The Reason live stream today. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Zach. Thank you. All right. Uh, so we are going to be joined in a little bit by uh, Nick Carter, the yes. uh, investor finance character and Bitcoin uh, a Bitcoin uh, bull extraordinaire in just a few minutes. Um, and we're going to be talking about his Operation Choke Point 2.0 is underway and crypto is in its crosshairs piece at uh, Pirate Wires, the Substack run by Mike Solana, which everybody should check out. Um, Zach, just uh, your uh, initial uh, feedback from or, or sense of what uh, Commissioner Peirce was talking about. Yeah, uh, I. it was interesting when she was talking about this kind of it, it, this comment she gets all the time about, you know, what, what's the point of you even being there? You're the one person who is uh, saying, hey, can we rethink these regulations? And you, you know, can write your dissents, but but there's no there's no action. I, I thought that was really interesting because mm -hmm. it's uh, I, I mean, I know. I, for one, am glad that there's at least one person on the yeah. SEC Board of Commissioners who's, uh, you know, forcing a kind of rethinking of that. So, um, yeah, I, I that that was one of the the more interesting insights to take away from that to kind of get a an idea of how things work on the board. Yeah, um, and I and then, agree, and also just the you know, I mean, like the her dissent on the Kraken fine. Uh, was if, you know the vote was four to one. She was the one against it. Like, you know, it's better that it's four to one than it's five to zero. And who knows? Uh, maybe she will win over some people. Her term doesn't end until twenty twenty five. SEC commissioners are, um, you know, they have a kind of overlapping uh, uh, stacked um, terms, so yeah. that no one party. You know, the idea behind that is that no one president essentially gets to you know fully install the whole board um so that there is a plural you know there's a there's differences of opinion and then she was talking a lot about uh or she talked a little bit about the sort of relationship that inevitably develops between the regulators and the industry that they're regulating where they just become more and more comfortable right. with uh certain firms because the the, the big firms tend to be the ones that both are better at complying and also kind of provide yeah. them with some uh, expertise on the industry. And, and that's the problem that, uh, you know, the economist George Stigler identified mm -hmm. as, be, you, call, you know, regulatory capture, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is really at the root of, of what's driving um, the crypto, at least that, that's, that's not what's driving kind of the crypto economy, what's driving that is a lot of it is frankly, you know, speculation and people trying to make a quick dollar. But th that that was at the core of its beginnings was to try to to sever that relationship. Um, yeah. And, you know, right now I, I was just about to pull this up earlier. Um, this is the amount of value locked in the so-called DeFi economy right now. And and you see it was peaking, you know, uh, close to the 200 billion mark, maybe a, I think it was about 180 billion was at its peak. And then there was the crypto crash. And right now there's 50, uh, almost $50 billion, you know, locked in this in this economy that people characterize as, as the Wild West. But th there's, despite that being the case, despite it still being a, a relatively unregulated space, there's still like, like something is happening there and some value is, is clearly being created and um there's there's a dynamism there and yeah. like the the whole idea that um that people can kind of opt into it and and know that there's risk to it and there's these there's this volatility there's these ups and downs and then there's the outright frauds like uh, or let's say alleged frauds like uh Sam Bankman Freed it's kind of like Inter it's just really interesting to watch this this emergent, relatively unregulated, unre and now pretty huge market develop. And I'm a little bit worried that kind of the, the heavy hand is just now starting to come down. 
Yeah, let's uh, run through some uh, comments from uh, Facebook as well as YouTube. Lawrence Espinoza asks, how do they pick and choose where to target? Uh, that would have been a great question for uh, Commissioner Peirce. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, she intimated the commissioner really sets the agenda. So it's up to Gary Gensler. Um, what are, you know, what are the priorities and things like that? But it's like any regulatory agency, I think, where there's a lot of different interests that are pushing to say, hey, do this, do that. Oftentimes, you know, one of the things, and uh, Zach, you were getting at this, there's an idea that what regulators do is that they look at it at the area that, you know, is under their survey or their domain, and they uh, say, where are things bad? And we're going to fix that. But in fact, oftentimes what happens is that they are working kind of at the behest of the biggest, most established firms in an industry. And they are doing the bidding of that firm where they might say, hey, you know what, like rule changes in this direction would help us. And, you know, why don't you do that? So that happens. Uh, yeah. Vera S. says, does the agency worry about the increased risk of potential legal challenges to it for its sub rosa regulation by enforcement efforts? I'm not sure I understand that fully, but I think the SEC doesn't care. They're not worried about that, uh, nor is any other regulatory agency. Occasionally, they'll get smacked down. Um, Let me chime in on the, the, the earlier question about why was Kraken specifically targeted. Um, and I don't know the exact answer. I see that Nick Carter just uh, popped in. So, you know, maybe we'll circle back to that in a second, actually. And uh, welcome Nick into the stream. Right. Hey, Nick, can you hear us all right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Thanks all for right. having me. Thank you for, uh, thank you for joining us. I see the mustache is back. Uh, <laughs> So we uh, just uh, talked with Commissioner Hester Peirce of the SEC, who dissented from the recent fine that was levied against Kraken. And um, you had, uh, in, a, in a previous kind of online conversation leading up to this, you had asked whether or not, um, do you think she would uh, distance herself from the idea that the SEC or any agency should try to essentially rule out any particular subset of an industry or field. She answered affirmatively like that. There's no reason that any agency should be going after a particular subset within a legal industry, which brings us to what we you know, want to start out talking with you about, which is your recent piece for pirate wires, the Mike Solana Substack. Operation Choke Point 2.0 is underway, underway, and crypto is in its crosshairs. Can you uh, very quickly uh, kind of summarize this piece for us and start off by talking about what Operation Choke Point 1.0 was? Yeah, let's start with that. Um, thanks for having me. Choke Point 1.0 was uh, a program that lasted from approximately 2014 to 2017, which involved uh, effectively ring fencing certain legal but uh, maybe distasteful industries um, and, and other legal industries that maybe, you know, depending on your perspective, were fine, um, mostly under the Obama administration. And instead of using Congress to set policy or legislate, um, the end around that was found was to use the FDIC to pressure banks to not uh, service these industries basically the banks would pressure the payment processors, which would then, uh, you know, deplatform, uh, you know, these specific industries. And the ones in questions were like firearms, ammunition, the adult entertainment industry, and a lot of other stuff. Uh, some of it pretty sketchy, like payday lending and things like that. Um, and, you know, what choke point, what really characterized choke point was sort of the informal nature. So it was all about insinuations and uh, veiled threats. Uh, that basically banks would be investigated if they uh, continued to platform these particular industries. And that ended in 2017 when a few members of Congress noticed what was happening. They got complaints from constituents um, and basically opened investigations and, and shed some light on the thing. So that was choke point 1.0. It didn't really end, though. I mean, um, it, it, basically, this guidance was internalized, and then payment processors and banks started to incorporate these risk standards into their assessments of who to platform, uh, which um, you know meant that there is still kind of an issue in terms of uh, a lot of these high risk industries being platformed thereafter. So what is yeah. 2.0 doing to put crypto in its crosshairs now as the headline puts it? 
Yeah, so some people accuse me of being inflammatory with this, but mm -hmm. I, you know, as a crypto person, I'm seeing it on the ground. I'm hearing directly from startups that they're being de-risked. You know, they're not able to get bank access. The standards for being able to be banked are much, much higher all of a sudden. So there is a concerted effort now, basically, from the administration on a cross-agency basis across virtually all bank re regulators in this country. Really, only recently, I'd say last three months, and in particular in the last month, uh, to sideline the crypto space and deprive them of their linkages to the traditional banking system. Mm. This is a multi-front attack. It's happening um, in on a coordinated basis. In fact, the coordination is very clear because sometimes the same guidance comes out from multiple agencies or organs of the government on the same day within hours. So it's not a spontaneous thing. I mean, clearly it's coordinated. And um, the objective is really to you know, the benign interpretation is, well, crypto is risky and so we don't want banks touching it in any way because we don't want crypto to have systemic effects on the banking system. That's the benign inter interpretation. The more hostile one is, well, we just want crypto to go away as an industry and so we're going to deprive them of their linkages to fiat, uh, which which would eventually kill the industry if it was successful. And so that, that's on the banking side of things. And uh, by the way, we'll link this and all the material we show in the show notes. So you can read uh, Nick Carter's piece in, in full by just you know following that link below. But uh, you know we, we, we've just been discussing in the first part of the show the, the latest SEC actions. Um, do you see that as part of this or is this just a totally... Uh, you, you know, do, do you suspect there's some sort of uh, coordinated action, you know, across the entire Biden administration? Um, or is the SEC really, you know, a totally separate, they've got their own thing going. Um, and also, like, how big a deal do you think this action that was taken against Kraken is in the big scheme of things? Is it kind of a, a minor setback for Kraken? Or is it like an existential threat to the whole industry? Yeah, a lot in there. Um, so the SEC has been hostile to crypto ever since, well, really under Clayton and now, of course, under Gensler. That hostility is nothing new. So mm -hmm. it's not entirely surprising that they're going after cracking and, and staking. I would say the intensification is evident from the SEC in terms of their oversight. I believe that they feel emboldened that they have more of a political mandate now to go after crypto post- mm -hmm. 2022 and the FTX collapse. So I think the same undercurrent trends are driving the SEC's action and the action of the Fed, FDIC, OCC, which is feeling politically emboldened due to a lot of people are sympathetic with attempts to ring funds through crypto space in the US after the collapses of last year. And also Congress being deadlocked. That's an important thing that I think people are not talking about is the prospects for legislation here of any sort are very minimal going forwards for the next two years. I don't think we'll see anything pertaining to crypto, actually, believe it or not, even though the house is, is somewhat favorable. Mm -hmm. So the agencies realize nothing's going to come out of Congress. Nothing's going to be done that way. They're going to be stymied. Let's say the Biden administration had a crypto, pa crypto package they wanted to push through. They wouldn't be able to do that with the house. So now a lot of folks in the executive branch are saying to themselves, well, it's on us to regulate, effectively legislate through regulation. Yeah. And that is absolutely what we're seeing at the yeah. SEC. They're interpreting their mandate in a very broad way, as is the Fed. The Fed is now growing their mandate. Um, there's a little, there's some wonkish details in the January 27 um, chain of events, which I mean, are probably worth digging into. But yeah, I think that's what we're seeing really is there's an understanding in Washington now. Congress is deadlocked. Okay, it's on us. The regulators to do something. Can I ask, um, you know, with something like FTX, clearly, you know, uh, kind of the crypto winter kind of sets the stage for more regulation because you have a lot of people who are probably going, you know, either grousing to their congressmen or, you know, there's a sense like, okay, you know, we lost this huge percentage of whatever we had invested in crypto for whatever reason. And we're kind of pissed about that. Uh, this, you know, happened. Uh, you know, after the uh, the tech bubble burst, you know, there's new stock markets up. The housing bubble burst, you know, there's new regulations. Um, with FTX, <clears throat> um, really puts gas on all of that. Can I ask you, Was is there something the crypto community should have been doing to kind of 
unmask or expose or pull, get people to stop putting money into FTX ahead of time? Or is there anything like that? Is there, you know, what if, if broadly speaking, crypto is going to be something that is independent of government and independent of regulation, not, not independent of risk, but like, is there something that people in the crypto space should have or could have been doing more of to unmask, like to squeeze out the, the SBFs of the world before they get to a point where they really threaten everybody who's acting, you know, in, in a positive way. Absolutely. Without a doubt. There's three things specifically. One is the investors need to be better with their diligence. Quite and Today, a lawsuit dropped against Sequoia and Paradigm, the lead investors in that FTX deal, alleging that they failed in their diligence. And in fact, they sort of endorsed FTX and caused people to trust it wrongly. I'm sympathetic to that. Frankly, I'm a VC. We didn't invest in FTX because they were right. an offshore brokerage. We looked at the early rounds. I have those pitch decks yeah, because they're an offshore brokerage. And we thought there was no way they could come onshore legally. They had the FTT token, which we thought was an unregistered security, which would cause them problems down the road. And they had Alameda trading on the exchange. I was looking back at my old email trail from LPs. Why didn't you invest in FTX? You got the look. What are you doing? You missed this huge deal. We told them exactly that. There's no way an exchange in the US would be able to have a proprietary trading firm owned by the same entity trading exclusively on the exchange. Right. That would not be allowed. And, so, and I guess it's worth hammering home the fact that you know FTX was was exposed at a moment when a company that was going thinking about buying it said, "Hey, eh, you know what? We're not going to do this because we don't trust it." I mean, the yeah. market on, on some profound level, the market worked to expose a bad company. But so, like, what, what do you like, think? What do you think happened there? Because the, you know, there's presumably some pretty smart people at Sequoia and these other big investors. Why did they miss what you were seeing pretty clearly? Different uh, approach to risk tolerance, um, hmm. and also um, they the deal dynamics. I mean, in 2021, remember hottest time venture capital history. I'm sure the deal was moving extremely fast. This was the fastest growing company in the industry and in the hottest mm -hmm. industry on earth for venture dollars. So the power would have been totally on the side of the founders and mm -hmm. not on the side of the VC. So I'm sure they understood they needed to do less diligence. Uh, this will come out in a court of law eventually what happened yeah. in order to win the deal. And they thought that that was a worthwhile trade-off. I mean, it wasn't just FTX where this was the mindset among VCs. It was very common back then. You, you know, you, you mentioned, uh, well, being... I'm sorry, could you also, you, you had said there were three things that, um, the crypto, uh, world oh, could yeah, be doing. Right. And, and just to get back to those, one of them was doing due diligence, like investors doing due diligence. Do you remember the other two? Uh, yeah. So for just to summarize the first thing, VCs aren't just VCs, their stakeholders aren't just their LPs, their stakeholders are everyone. And when you're investing in these exchanges that have hundreds of millions of clients globally, your stakeholders, everyone that uses crypto, because if you fail, you'll bring the regulatory hammer down, which is what is happening now. So VCs need to understand that. Um, two, proof of reserves. It's a very obvious thing. If there had been a proof of reserves in place, which is basically a procedure whereby an exchange or custodian demonstrates that they have reserves and then they compare those to their client liabilities and they show they match. That's cryptographically provable. It's technically very doable. Quite a few exchanges do it already. If FTX had done that, obviously they wouldn't have been able to commit fraud. Right. If proof of reserves had been normalized throughout the industry, FTX wouldn't have been able to do it, assuming they were mm -hmm. in this parallel universe, they were doing fraud and they would have been sticking out like a sore thumb. So if that was normalized throughout the industry, these insolvencies, FTX, Mt. Gox, Quadriga, they would be really evident. So that is a very simple thing. I'm pushing very hard for it. You'll actually see legislation. Texas introduced a bill asking for it. Mm -hmm. I think that'll pass. That will become part of the self-regulatory framework that is used in the industry. And it's a very positive thing. Unfortunately, we're too late now. And the only reason it's got so much uptake is because of FTX. The third thing is just building better decentralized exchanges such that we don't have a reliance on centralized exchanges. That's also happening. So the technological trends here are very self-regulatory as far as I can tell. 
you with with regards to the um, the proof of reserves question, you know, I, I want to play this little clip from uh, Gensler, the the video that he put out after the Kraken action uh, that has been uh, kind of circulating, especially among uh, what you might describe as the Bitcoin maximalists. Uh, I, I want to play this and get your reaction because they are saying that this this validates the view that uh, you know it's it's um, Bitcoin and self custody are the only way to go. Um, so let let's just play this real quick and get your reaction. Crypto, not your keys, not your crypto. You see, you're basically an investor in their platform. If it goes under, and we've seen plenty of that recently you end up in line in the bankruptcy court. That's why it's so important that these companies and platforms comply with the securities law. There's an- So, you know, it's the point there is that, uh, you know, Gensler is, you know, quoting the famous, not your keys, not, yeah. not your crypto line. And that is kind of uh, validating the idea that you really shouldn't even have your your crypto on an exchange uh, if, if you want you know total security and sovereignty what do you make of that nick yeah i mean i agree obviously yeah. you know we invest heavily in startups that help people self custody their coins so i clearly support that crypto only works if people have some self custody because otherwise we give all the power back to the intermediaries and we haven't accomplished anything because then the government can co-opt the intermediaries and, and use them as they will However, I'm also pragmatic and I recognize that exchanges will exist. There's demand for their services. We can't do everything in a non-custodial way. Um, so, there, and there's a whole set of allocators that will need centralized touch points to custody their coins, to trade on them, et cetera. The decentralized infrastructure isn't the totality of the industry and it will never be. So in my view, the challenge is to improve the exchanges that do exist and pressure them to be as accountable as possible, which is why I'm an advocate of proof of reserves, for instance. Regarding like w whether it validates Bitcoin maximalism, I mean, staking can be done self-custodially. It can be done on your own. Even there's actually you know, services that allow you to stake. If you don't want to stake yourself, you still kind of retain access to your coins, but you're relying on a more sophisticated pool that will help you do it which is not a securities transaction, in my opinion. Kraken may have left themselves open to that allegation in terms of the structure of, I think that is, I'm actually sympathetic to the SEC in that particular instance, hmm. but there's certainly ways to stake, even as a retail individual who's not very sophisticated about the technology or anything, there's ways to outsource that to others which don't render it a security. So I don't see it as, Vindicating Bitcoin maximalism, you know, in in either direction or or uh, yeah. So it, it, you know, staking ultimately will be more decentralized by virtue of the fact that Kraken is out of the business of doing it. Uh, just a comment from Bitcoin Motorist writing in from YouTube saying, "I just buy Bitcoin. I don't stake. Should I care about any of this?" And I mean, I guess the answer is if you don't own your if you don't own your keys or you don't have your keys you should be worried about it regardless of whether or not you're staking, right? I think you should care that the SEC is harassing yeah. the exchanges. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people, you know, that may think that they're totally insulated from that, they still have some reliance on an exchange yeah. as an on and off ramp. We do need these touch points with banks and with the you know traditional financial system. We'll always need that. Mm -hmm. We don't have a perfectly peer-to-peer -peer economy of Bitcoin that I'm not even sure that's really possible. So, yeah, I mean, I'm concerned that the SEC is going after Kraken in particular has been one of the most reputable and successful mm -hmm. exchanges. Um, and, you know, I'd be concerned if they're going after Coinbase, too. Even if you don't mm -hmm. agree with everything Coinbase does or everything Kraken does, we still do need these credible intermediaries. You, you said that you you do have some sympathy for the SEC in, in this particular Kraken case. And, and you also mentioned earlier that you, you know, part of the red flags with FTX for you was that they were offshore. Presumably that the red flag was that they're not complying with U.S. regulation. So, you know, what are the realms that you see regulation being appropriate for the crypto space and where should they just 
the government just be, you know, completely hands off? Yeah, great question. I mean, I don't think that um, a no regulation world is is the best because clearly the crypto industry has failed to self regulate. I think you could ask exchanges to do proof of reserve. Um, that's mm. similar in some ways to um, having oversight uh, over, uh, you know, I, I would say it's actually more of a substitute for a, a really aggressive top down uh, regulatory stance. Um, I think asking exchanges to segregate client and operating capital in an accounting mm -hmm. and a, a literal sense um, mm -hmm. is completely the right way. If you look at NYDFS, they had guidance recently that they published asking for that segregation, asking to privilege client deposits in the case of liquidation. I totally agree with that. Um, you know, it, it doesn't make sense for clients of exchanges to be uh, really subordinate junior creditors in the case of uh, bankruptcy. There, you should have a trust style product um, in the name of the client such that they're insulated in the case of bankruptcy or something like that. Uh, so, you know, those are really common sense things that I think should exist. Yeah. Uh, aside from that, I think, um, you know, I well, other domains where regula regulation is warranted would be a kind of a securities law framework where we allowed to bring to we were able to bring tokens into concert with securities law through some disclosure framework that was fit for purpose. The way we have a disclosure framework for equities, the things you need to disclose are different. So we will need a revised framework. However, the administration has not Im implied anything or suggested that they might want to do that. So that's more of sort of a wish list item, but I don't think it'll happen anytime soon. Do you? F oh, go ahead, Zach. Well, no, just on the proof of proof of reserve question, is the government necessary in order to implement that sort of thing, or are there ways to? Is, is it possible to validate that some other way? It's uh, right now. It's being done on a purely discretionary, bottom-up basis by mm -hmm. a number of exchanges, including Binance. They just released a new implementation of their POR, and it's really client-facing. So it allows the clients to have the confidence that the exchanges have their coins. And mm -hmm. you don't need the government to do it. You don't even need an audit firm necessarily to oversee the process. Um, but because not all exchanges do it, I think it's warranted that the state would actually ask them to. I know I'll be called a status gotcha. for, for saying that, but uh, status. Uh, you know, I, it's actually a really proactive and positive measure. Do you, um, are, are there places either in Congress or among regulatory agencies that are pushing in the right direction, or is it just overwhelmingly, uh, you know, over the past year, there have been so many negative uh, events that the, you know, it's virtually impossible to change the kind of direction of uh, the regulatory push right now. Well, um, Hester Purse, your guest that was yeah. on just now, obviously does an amazing job as um, one of the minority members of the SEC. Uh, I think she offers a voice of reason there, an alternative voice. Uh, in Congress, the Republican-controlled House is where a lot of crypto folks mm -hmm. are looking to in terms of yeah. defending against some of what I perceive as an unconstitutional overreach, especially mm -hmm. through the bank regulators to redline the crypto space. So, um, you know, Representative Emmer, who's now the whip, or mm -hmm. McHenry, who's the chairman of the Financial Services Committee. Many of us in the crypto space are hoping uh, that they might be galvanized into action here. Uh, in the Senate, there's a few key members as well, but it's very unclear which what the Senate stance is on crypto. Mm -hmm. And then the courts, honestly, I, I believe that in many cases, the facts are on our side, um, it, whether it's securities law, whether it's stable coins being securities or not, which is now apparently an open question. Um, I think the courts would generally take sensible common sense views. And so mm -hmm. a lot of this will play out actually, I, I think eventually we'll have a series of marquee Supreme Court decisions. And um, the, the problem is that that just takes too long. And so if you're predicating your business on something where mm -hmm. there's a regulatory prohibition, you can't wait for a favorable court case to you know to follow your way. Uh, yeah. Are there states that uh, you know? Obviously, certain states are better than others in terms of regulating um, uh, you know crypto and its operations. What is what are the worst states right now, and what are the best? Historically, New York's been the worst because they had the Bit License, which was a very restrictive. Um, yeah 
um, basically charter you needed to obtain to do business there. I think and there is there's no indication. I, I mean, like New York State and New York City should be the world capital of fucking Bitcoin, but there's no indication that anybody's rethinking that, right? They've gotten better. Their newer yeah. guidance is good, and the bit license isn't as hard to get as it was before. It was kind of a shakedown, in my yeah. opinion, before, and um, the barrier to entry has lowered, so I'm sort of less upset at them these days. Mm -hmm. The best state by far, in my opinion, is Texas. Texas legislature has three current bills regarding crypto. I think mm -hmm. two of them pertain to mining and one of them, as I mentioned, pertains to exchange credibility. Um, so, uh, you know, what's interesting is New York is the center of gravity for crypto in the U.S., mm -hmm. even Despite though Despite a bad regulatory regime. What about what are they doing with uh uh, Bitcoin mining at this point. Is there any movement on their attempts to kind of ban proof of work? Kathy Hochul signed um, the after sitting on it. Yeah. We thought she was going to desk veto prior to the election. After the election, I, I guess she didn't need that anymore. So she signed their moratorium on vertically integrated Bitcoin mines, mm -hmm. which is not that doesn't cover all of them in New York, but it's the start. And I'm sure eventually they'll ban it outright. So yeah, on on the state by state basis, that's a interesting phenomenon i think you'll see quite a few blue states ban it bitcoin mining that is and and red states encourage it the way texas is for instance how do you when you think about players in the bitcoin or crypto space calling for regulation how do you decipher or differentiate you know who are actually who are the people that are actually trying to improve things and who are just the rent seekers because this was like mm -hmm an issue with, this was an, an issue with Sam Bankman Freed. I mean, it was possibly a, a major part of his downfall is, you know, we pulled up this tweet when we were talking about him before from the uh, CEO of Binance, who ultimately was the person who blew the whistle that started the cascade and the downfall. And he said, you know, we won't support people who lobby against other industry players behind their backs. And there's, you know, this deep suspicion, and I think very warranted yeah. within the crypto community of uh, any financial regulation whatsoever. But you are saying that there is some prudent regulation. Do you have, I don't know, a rule of thumb, or are there red flags that you're on the lookout for when you hear people in the crypto space talking about regulation? Yeah, I mean, the first thing is qui bono, right? I mean, look at what SFTX was lobbying for. It was basically to allow themselves to get a regulatory blessing to come on shore and operate a spot and derivatives market under the U.S. aegis. Um, and they were regu they were lobbying against DeFi. So like, it was very clear that they were not good actors in that process. And mm -hmm. I and many others are immensely relieved that their efforts were stymied. I think we were actually very close to them achieving that kind of regulatory capture in DC, especially with their weird proximity to the SEC, which I think still needs to be investigated and their IEX acquisition. So it was very clear in that case that they were not operating in good faith. Generally, the rule of thumb would be, are you supporting the core crypto ideological principles, which have to do with allowing self-custody, you know, transactions that are occurring outside the um, ambit of the bank system, right? So that's a very core thing. Do you support financial privacy, self-determination, basically freedom to transact? Do you support cash, the properties of cash, right? In a digital context, that's what stable coins are. That's cash that settles finally, instantly, uh, with no settlement risk whatsoever, and where you don't have to ask permission, you know, transact. Do you support non-custodial, uh, more complex transactions like DeFi. To the extent you're doing that, I think it's fine to engage with regulators in the state. Um, but if you are trying to improve your own standing in the industry at the expense of those principles and those ideologies, then you know that's when that's when there's a problem. I wonder what, if you know, just yeah. I mean, th this will you know. I know we're, we're getting near the end of our time, so this is kind of like my last question for Nick, and then I'll I'll let you wrap up with him. Nick is like. What is um, the that you, you, this idea of digital cash being, you know, one of the fundamental propositions of cryptocurrency? Uh, what is 
for people who might be watching this who are curious about cryptocurrency, but they're not steeped in it like you are, could you just make the, the big picture case for why you think this industry is thriving and or you know wh why it's grown so much in a relatively short span and what is the like what's the point of it what why is digital the idea of digital cash good and necessary and why is decentralized finance um a, a good thing well there's two main things that um two main trends basically that that crypto people it's a broad tent are fighting against or trying to restore one is there's a sound money contingent so basically believing that we should reinstitute a monetary system that has less discretion and so that's a rebellion against the waves of credit that are created with basically discretionary monetary policy that's a long discussion of course so that's mm -hmm. a big part of it the second is a push to restore transactional privacy that has been eroded since really the 70s <clears throat> since finance was digitized that's and since um you know intermediaries have been more empowered and there have been a specific number of legal cases especially the third party doctrine that meant that mm -hmm. financial privacy has been uh, effectively eliminated in the US and a lot of us identify this as a very dangerous trend um and are trying to push back at it so DeFi and stable coins uh and of course bitcoin are attempts to restore something which we once had hmm. which was financial autonomy and the freedom to, to transact without asking the state for permission um uh, final question uh what's the uh state of concern that you have over central bank digital currencies and um are they moving forward in a way uh, obviously, governments are going to try and confuse people to say, oh, this is digital cash. Um, obviously, it's it's a very distinct, you know, alternative to actual anonymous or mostly anonymous cash. What's going on with central bank digital currency uh, formation that's worrying you the most right now? In the U.S., I'm not too worried about it. Thankfully, um, the Fed has actually pumped the brakes on it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I think people are, they recognize that it wouldn't make sense to disintermediate the bank sector and just install the Federal Reserve as a retail facing institution. <clears throat> so not too worried here overseas in more in countries with, you know, fewer protections for individuals. I expect it will be implemented. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we see implementations in China, but thankfully, I think the US is is wide awake to the, the risks and the issues. What about the, the EU? Uh, because I've read a couple of reports over the past few weeks that the EU is uh, seriously thinking about it. Do you think that's a place where kind of like the US where people will kind of back away from it uh, for a variety of reasons? I think it's more likely to happen in the EU. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, then least... certainly than here. But is I mean, is it the type of thing where China can kind of force a central bank digital currency, whereas if you're living in a more democratic country or one with a, a longer tradition of some level of nationalism or autonomy, it might be more difficult. Yes, absolutely. But um, in the EU, they're already going cashless in many countries. There's mm -hmm. less of a tradition of cash. If you look at some of the Nordics, almost entirely cashless. Yeah. And they've just passed a sweeping framework covering crypto, which basically bans stable coins. Mm -hmm. And they see stable coins as a competitive threat to CBDC. So that should be the canary in the coal mine where you see stable coins banned. That's when there's a desire to institute a CBDC. That is, it's kind of amazing if it happens in Europe too, because the Euro is, you know, like a new, relatively new phenomenon when you think about monetary history and how hard it was to get that implemented after centuries of, you know, individualized or nationalized currencies. Yeah, so it's just a fundamentally more collectivist place yeah. and a, a more fertile breeding ground for ideas like CBDCs. Well, we are going to end it there. We have been talking with Nick Carter. Do check it, follow him on Twitter at Nick, N-I-C underscore Carter and read his uh, piece, Operation Choke Point 2.0 2 is underway and crypto is in its crosshairs at Pirate Wires. Uh, Nick, where else should people follow you? Um, all my work is at my personal website, nickcarter.info. So you can find everything there. Thank you so much. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, guys. And Zach, we will, uh, 
I guess we're calling it a, a, a moment right now, too. So we're, as Joe Biden would say, we're putting a lid on this and uh, we will see you uh, next week, assuming we wake up in time, unlike uh, <laughs> unlike Joe Biden. Thanks, Thanks. everyone.